can't beat God given. That's what the writer wrote that song, you can't beat God given. And that is so true. So we ought to be encouraged to continue to give, to give, to give. I'm so glad to see that everyone is here intact. All your facsimiles are together. You're connected. Uh, your bones are connected to your body. And uh, you've survived the storm. You survived the storm. And it goes to show us that there's a blessing. Even in the storm, there's a blessing. And I believe this storm brought blessings. <laughs> Amen. And uh, because it sure put a lot of damage on our uh, house. There's a lot of damage done to the house and to the roof and to the siding, the siding of the house. But nevertheless, I, I believe that God's going to fix it so that it's all going to be repaired or replaced. Yes. All right. Amen. It's, it's going to happen. Amen. And I thank God for that. Because it's long overdue and, and uh, normally from our pockets we wouldn't or couldn't find this source to, to uh, pay for the replacement. However, God knows all things and like I said, we were blessed through the storm. Amen. How many here were blessed through the storm? That's right. Amen. All right. Uh, very briefly, we're going to uh, go to the word of the Lord. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 21, ending at verse 35. Matthew 18. Matthew 18. Uh, I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, Then uh, came... Peter to him and said, Lord, how, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Am I reading it uh, the, the right? Matthew 18, beginning at verse 21. You all have it? Yes. I keep hearing a rumble. <laughs> all right. It says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Till seven times. Jesus said to him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought to him which owed him 10,000 talents. But after much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him not to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. And then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him of the debt. He loosed him and he forgave him of that debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying pay me that thou that thou owest 
And when his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into the prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. And when the Lord after that then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all the debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So today we're just going to be speaking about a simple subject a lifestyle of forgiveness. A lifestyle of forgiveness. We're going to be using a lot of illustrations in this particular lesson. Uh, I mean, have you ever known someone who had a problem with forgiving? <laughs> someone that held a grudge and wouldn't let it go of it? Most likely they walked around bitter and angry most of the time. They walked around bitter and angry. It's, you know, it's a horrible thing to be walking around bitter and angry yeah. most of the time. Yeah. They are miserable people. Yeah. Miserable people. And I personally, I, don't, I wouldn't want to be around people like that. Who's always bitter and always angry. Uh, Hebrews 12 and 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Look diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God, and lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Paul's saying here that you must not allow bitterness to come between uh, us in any way because it can destroy our joy, yeah. it can destroy our peace, and it can destroy our victory, and also destroy our relationship with Christ. Yes. Can I get a witness today? Yeah. Illustration, I'm going to use this illustration. Once there was a millionaire who owned a lot, who owned a lot, that is a piece of land, who owned a lot in an exclusive residential area of a large city. This lot presented an unusual problem. The lot itself was only two yards wide and but nearly 100 feet long. There was nothing that could be, that could do, nothing could be done even with it but to sell it to one of the neighbors on, on either side. So. You got the neighbors on either side, then this here little skinny lot of, uh, that was two, two yards, I believe, and 100 feet long. And so he went to his neighbors on the one side of uh, the lot, and he asked, he asked if he would be interested in buying the lot. And that neighbor says, well, only as a favor, then named a ridiculously low price. The millionaire exploded. Why, that's not even a one-tenth of what it's worth. So he stormed out and he, he went next door to the other side, uh, to that neighbor. And to his dismay, the other neighbor offered less. Look, said the neighbors. He says, I've got you over a barrel. You can't sell that lot to anyone else. You can't build on it. So... There's my offer. Take it or leave it. The millionaire was beside himself with rage. 
Within a few days, he hired an architect and a contractor to build one of the strangest houses ever conceived. Only five feet wide, running the, the, the length of his property, the house was little more than a row of tiny rooms, which barely each each barely able to accommodate a, a stick of furniture. That's all. And then the neighbors complained, but the city officials could find no codes or violations to stop the construction. And when it was finished, the millionaire moved into the uncomfortable house. There he stayed until his death. Hallelujah. That house, that house there in that strange lot, that house which was known, became known as the Spite House. That was the name of it, the Spite House. Still stands as a monument to one man's problem of hate and unforgiveness. Now I want you to know this, there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of people of God living in spite houses today. Oh, can I get a witness? Amen. I said there's a lot of Christians living in spite houses today. Jesus told Peter that he should forgive. Forgiveness is a, a major part of being a Christian. And when we refuse to forgive, then we begin to allow bitterness to stop us from entering into fellowship with God. Luke 15 and 28, the older brother refused to enter the house. He was angry. He was not ready to forgive. He was holding on a grudge. And the father pleads for him to come in. Well, number one, why do so many people hold grudges? Yes, we'll ask that question. Why do so many people hold grudges? Most people hold grudges because of hurts. We tend to remember things that have hurt us or scared our lives. I remember what you did. I remember what you did. This illustration, Clara Brown, founder of the American Red Cross, was reminded one day of a vicious deed that someone had done to her for year, from years before. She acted as she had never even heard of the incident. Don't you remember it, her friend asked? No, came Barton's reply. I distinctly remember forgetting it. Yes, remember forgetting it, experiencing God's forgiveness. If we are going to walk in fellowship with God, we must not continue to hold wrongs done to us or done against us uh, uh, from others. We, we got to walk in fellowship with God and remember not to hold these grudges uh, uh, that we you know, feel that people have done uh, to us. And then another reason why so many people hold grudges is because we are reactionary, reactionary. You hurt me, and I'll hurt you. Sounds like a two-year-old, doesn't it? Sounds like a two-year-old. You hurt me, and I'll hurt you. You say something bad about me, and I will say something bad about you. We are determined to get even or one up on someone that has hurt us. Yes, we're determined to get even with them. People of God, we have to be careful not to be that determined to get even with somebody. If there's an, another illustration, two Christians, Paul and John, lived next door to each other in the suburbs. One day, Paul saw down a tree which adjoined their two properties. The tree fell and smashed on John's lounge windows. John stormed out of the house and hollered at Paul, Paul hollered at John, and soon they had each other by the clothes, and finally, John threw Paul to the ground. Paul got up and brushed himself off. Now look here, John, he said. It's high time that each one of us act like a Christian. He paused for a moment, then glared at his neighbor and said, so why don't you turn 
to your left cheek and let me punch you. <laughs> Why don't you turn to your left cheek and let me punch you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just sounds. Uh, some people have even said that uh, in our lives as we were coming up. Turn to the other cheek. You know, when you get into a vicious argument, and that's the first thing that pops out somebody's mouth, especially those who say they know the Lord. Well, you know, the word says you got to turn to the other cheek, so why don't you turn to the other cheek so I can smack you on your other side? Well, people of God, that is not, that is not being a Christian. That, that is holding the grudge, and you are not forgiven of that individual. Uh, 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 there's another illustration button there's an illustration about a button in a tour shop where they sell you know buttons and you, 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 you pin a button on somebody's shirt or their jacket and the button says to err is human to forgive is out of the question <laughs> <laughs> to err is human but to forgive is out of the question because we long for justice rather than forgiveness. Another illustration. I told you there was a lot of illustrations, so you, you can't, don't get on my case. I said there's a lot of illustrations. A little boy had a fight with his older brother, and one day the little boy refused to speak to his brother all day. When bedtime came, his mother went to the little boy and says, Don't you think that you should forgive your brother? Forgive your brother before you go to sleep. The Bible says that we should not let the sun go down on our wrath. After thinking for a moment, the little boy replied, but how can I keep the sun from going down? <laughs> we want those who have wronged us to pay for what they've done. But God says, in in Mark 11 and 25, and when you stand praying, forgive. Yeah, yeah. And if you have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Matthew 6 and 14 says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Matthew 6 and 15 says, but if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither Will your father forgive your trespasses? But we want to say it's not fair. We must remember that life may not always be fair, but God is just God and will handle every problem fairly. And we must learn to release our anger and forgive by turning it, turning it over, turning it over. Oh, yes, Lord. Turning it over to God. Turning it over to Jesus. I hear that song deep down in my heart. Turn it over to Jesus. Turn it over to Jesus. Turn it over to Jesus and everything will be all right. Can I get a witness today? Clap your hands and praise the Lord. Romans, Romans. I'm going to be, I'm going to be finished soon. Romans, Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. But rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, saith the Lord. Yes. Romans 12 and 20 says, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him, and if he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Romans 12 and 21 says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Clap your hands and praise his name. <laughs> then another question, why should we forgive? Why should we forgive? Well, to live in peace. When we say we forgive, but hold on to resentment somehow, we think that we're hurting the other person, but we're really only hurting ourselves. Illustration, a lady was sick, and so she went to the doctor. He examined her and did a number of tests and told her the bad news. I'm sorry uh, to have to tell you this, uh, but I'm afraid you'll, you have contracted rabies. 
The doctor left the room for a minute, and when he returned, the woman was busy writing on a piece of paper, and he asked, what are you doing? What are you doing writing your will? And she says, no, I'm just making a list of all the people I'm going to bite. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I got rabies, I'm going to make a list of all the people I'm going to take a big bite out of. Well, the alternative, the alternative to forgiveness is in the end of ceaseless process of hurt, bitterness and anger, resentment and self-destruction, unhappy marriage problems produce the largest number of spite houses. Did you hear what I said? I want you to remember now, don't you, don't you be living in the spite house. Don't you be living in the spite house. Amen. Amen. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Divorce does not always bring an end, but most of the time it makes matters worse. The survey, survey shows that 41% 41 per, 41 of remarried women were still furious with their first husbands. Then 31% of the men still angry with their first wife. Oh yes. Then illustration, another illustration. A man was laying, dying in a hospital bed. But as he lay there, he suddenly remembered an old enemy he had once had a grudge against. Calling a nurse to his bedside, he whispered, nurse, nurse. Please summon my old enemy. The enemy arrived, and the man opened one eye. He opened one eye, and he said to him, My enemy, I have called you here today to say I'm sorry for all the wrong I've done to you. Then he paused and added, But mind you, if I ever get better, you be sure that the old grudge still holds good. If I ever get better. <laughs> Lord have mercy, Jesus. Uh huh, uh huh. Everybody say uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Steve Harvey up here, you know. <laughs> Amen. Holding on, holding on to resentment. Mm -hmm. Holding on to resentment only hurts one who holds onto it. We must choose to love. We must choose to love. Love is a choice. You can live. You can live in anger and bitterness, or you can choose to love. Oh, yes, Luke 6 and 27, but I say unto you, which hear, which hear, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. And Luke 6 and 28, bless them that curse you and pray for them which despitefully use you. We forgive for our own peace. Yes, yes, and we forgive to move forward and not live in the past. There's nothing more pitiful than a person who is continually living in the past. Another illustration. After the Civil War, Robert E. Lee visited a Kentucky lady who took him to the remains of a grand old tree in front of her house. There she bitterly cried that its limbs and trunk had been destroyed by federal artillery fire. She looked at Lee for a word condemning the North for the, at least sympathizing with her loss. After brief silence, Lee says, cut it down, my dear madam, and forget it. It's better to forgive the injustice of the past than to allow them to remain. Let bitterness take root and poison the rest of our lives. Oh yes, let the bitterness take root and poison the rest of our lives. Unforgiveness always keeps a record. Oh yes, always keeps a record. Unforgiveness always keeps an, an account. Yes, get up and get over it and move on. That's right, get up, get over it and move on. Joseph could have held a grudge, yes. abused by his brother, thrown into a pit. Yes, coat taken from him, sold into slavery, lands in an Egyptian, Egyptian prison. Did you hear what I said? Yes. 
lambs right smack down in the middle of an Egyptian prison. Yes, Genesis 41 and 51 says, And Joseph called on the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, He hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. So we must, we must, uh, uh, because we have been forgiven. Yes, we must because we have been forgiven. Can I get a witness? Amen. Yes, why do most people hold grudges? Because it hurts and because we must, uh, because we have been forgiven. Illustration, a Sunday school teacher had uh, just concluded her lesson and wanted to make sure that she had her point. So she said, can anyone tell me what you must do before you can obtain forgiveness of sin. There's a short pause, and then from the back of the room, a small boy spoke up. Sin, he said. Sin, bits and pieces. Oh, praise his name. There are some people that you will rub wrong, the rub the wrong way. Then some will be a thorn in your flesh. Then there's some that will be a whole bush. And if you plan on holding a, a large, a, a hold, if you plan on holding onto a grudge, pray that you never need, you never need to be forgiven. In the parable that Jesus uh, told the servant who owed his master ten thousand talents, this debt amounted to about fifteen years of a laborer's wage. And the servant could not pay it, but his master forgave him the debt. But the servant in turn, when the man that owed him a hundred denarii, then this was about one day's wage, and the servant would not forgive the debt. So when the master heard it, he was furious, and the master is God, and we are his servants. So we forgive because we are forgiven. Yeah. Conclusion, I want you to know that you, are you still living on or st are you still living in a spite house? Ask yourself that question. Am I living in a spite house? Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, are you still living in a spite house? Answer him. <laughs> oh, be, be, be truthful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yes, be truthful. Are you living in a spite house? Ah, uh, put it down. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Amen. Turn it all over to Jesus. That's right. Turn it over to Jesus. Uh-huh. If you want to win souls, get rid of that spite house. Uh-huh. If you want to be show love, get rid of that spite house. If you want to show love, get rid of that spite house. I want you to know that Jesus loves you today. He wants to bless you. And the only way he can bless you is for you to get rid of your spite house. Oh, praise his name. So it's a lifestyle, a lifestyle of forgiveness. It's a lifestyle that we have to live. Amen. Everybody clap your hands and praise the Lord. Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. Everyone stand at this time. Hallelujah. Praise him. Praise him as you stand. Praise him. I believe there's victory here today. I believe somebody.